As the name implies, a two-factor analysis of variance allows you to decide whether or not two factors make a significant difference in your experiment. As an example, let's look at these specimens known as dog bones. And the way this works, there's dog bones made of materials of, of copper, steel, and plastic. And at both ends of the dog bone, you would clamp these into a machine. So you would apply a clamp on the left and the right side. The machine would slowly pull apart the dog bone, and it would measure the force needed to break that material. These regions of the dog bones are known as fillets, and you've got a choice for either small fillets or large fillets. And we're curious whether or not the material, copper, steel, or plastic, or the fillet radius, makes a difference in the breaking strength of each of these samples. This means we have two different factors. The first factor is the material that we're using, and the second factor is the fillet radius. So in all, we've got six different types of dog bones, so as an engineer, you ask somebody to make these dog bones for you and run the experiments. And the technician returns a day later and presents you with a table. And in that table, it tells us the material, steel, plastic, or copper, and then the fillet radius, small or large. And for each of these samples, the technician had measured a strength required to break it. So if I received this table, the first thing I would ask the technician is whether or not he or she ran the experiments in the order shown. So for example, is this the first experiment, the second, the third, et cetera, on down? And if that's true, it's a really good thing, because that means the technician had randomized the order in which he or she had tested all of these samples. And it's really nice to randomize your sample, because you eliminate things like instrument drift, for example. Perhaps the instrument was accurate for the first couple of samples, but something caused it to drift over time, or it caused it to become slightly inaccurate over time. So by randomizing these things, we can do what's called randomizing out this instrument drift. And there's a lot of different unknowns that you won't be aware of, so it's always, always a good thing to randomize the order in which you run your experiments. So in this case, we've got a number of different experiments that were run. So a whole slew of these. We want to figure out, based on all of these data points, does it matter what material the dog bones were made out of, and does it matter whether or not the fillets were small or large? And it's really difficult to tell at a glance, looking at this table, whether or not either of those things are true. Before you do any kind of statistics at all, confirm with the technician, or if you are running the experiments yourself, confirm that all of the tests were run correctly. In other words, you ask yourself, did the dog bones slip in the instrument? Were there any chips or any other aberrations in the dog bones? And if this is true for any of the dog bones, immediately throw out those data. The, those particular data points are worthless. But don't arbitrarily throw out any data points. If they look particularly high or low, don't, don't arbitrarily throw them away unless you can justify it. Once you confirm that all the experiments were run correctly and none of the samples were damaged before measuring it, always look at the data graphically. So here I've plotted the force needed to break each sample, and I've plotted the material, and I've plotted whether or not it was a small or a large fillet on each of the samples. In each case, here are the actual data points. It allows me to see the, the actual measurements. And in each case, I've plotted the mean value for each of the bars, plus or minus one standard deviation with the error bars. And that allows me to see at a glance that the steel samples are likely stronger than the plastic samples, and likely stronger, again, than the copper samples. It also lets me see that there's a chance that the large fillet makes the sample stronger than the small fillet. But that's not entirely obvious, because we see these overlapping data points. So we wonder, well, is it by chance that the large fillets are stronger, or is this a real phenomenon? Can we justify that they are indeed stronger? And that's tough to tell without doing a two-factor analysis of variance. And that's a real utility of doing statistical analyses, when it's tough to tell whether or not a difference is significant. Probably the most useful thing that you'll get out of a two-factor analysis of variance are three different p-values. In this case, I've called them p-material, p-fillet, and p-interaction. Typically, a small p-value, a p-value of less than typically 0.05, we can say that material, we could justify, we could say, yeah, it makes a, a significant difference. So when you look at these data, I would expect a relatively small value for 
the P material. It looks like the steel is indeed a lot stronger than the copper. I don't see much overlap or any overlap at all between the data points between those two. And it looks like the plastic samples are going to be the weakest. So I would expect in this when we run the analysis I would expect a small value for P material. It's a little bit harder, like I said, to figure out whether or not the large fillet makes a significant difference, whether it's significantly stronger than the small fillet. So I would expect a p-value for the fillet to be small, but not necessarily less than 0.05. In this third p-value, p-interaction, it tells us whether or not the large fillet made a more significant difference when we ran one factor versus another. It looks here on the graph that the difference between the large and the small fillet for the copper sample is larger than the difference for the steel sample. If that's indeed the case, then I would expect a small value for P interaction. When I run the two-factor analysis of variance, I get a very, very small value for the uh, P material. And that indicates it's highly unlikely that we just randomly chose steel samples that were stronger than copper. And we, it's highly unlikely that we just randomly chose samples for uh, plastic that are weaker than both copper and steel. We could say that the odds of this occurring are about 1 in 2 billion, so highly unlikely. The p-value for the fillet, it's not as small as p-material, but it does look like it made a significant difference. This value of 0.025 is smaller than our selection criterion of, of 0.05. So in this case, I would say that, yeah, the fillets actually made a difference. It actually significantly improved the strength of both copper, steel, and plastic. And this p-interaction of 0.6 suggests that it doesn't make a more impactful difference for plastic copper or steel. It improves it about the same by the same amount in all three cases. Here's a second simulated data set in which I've tightened up the standard deviations for all of my samples and I did that to show that the difference between the large fillet and the small fillet are more significant. We don't see any overlap or very little overlap whatsoever between all of the data sets and consequently that decreases our p-value from it was 0.025 before and now it's 3 times 10 to the negative 6. So much more significant difference for the fillet. And here's a simulated data set in which the material made a significant difference, but the fillet radius itself didn't make any difference whatsoever. We see a great deal of overlap between the data sets for the small and large fillet, and consequently we get a relatively large p-value for that factor. And here's a simulated data set in which neither the material nor the fillet made a significant difference. We see across the board the strength, the breaking strength is about the same and there's significant overlap between uh, all six of our, our samples. Here's a simulated data set in which the strength of the material didn't make a difference. A relatively large value, a p-value for material, copper, steel, and plastic, break about the same. However, the fillet actually made a difference. On so this simulated data set, the large fillets, for whatever reason, decreased the strength of the material. And we see the p-value for the fillet is relatively small. Another thing is that there is no interaction between the three. And what that means, again, is that the difference between the mean values for copper, steel, and plastic, the large fillet decreased the strength of the material, but it did so by the same amount in all three cases. So there, there's no interaction in this simulated data set. So you might be asking, what does it take to have an interaction? What would that look like? How could we generate a simulated data set in which P interaction is a small value? This is what that data set might look like. I see a very small value for both P material and P fillet. So there's, again, the, the material made a difference and the presence of a fillet made a difference. However, now I see a very small value for P interaction. And when I look at the difference between the small and large fillet for copper and the difference between that for steel, I see about the same value. However, when I look at the plastic, it looks like the presence of a fillet made a more significant difference. It was more beneficial for the plastic sample than it was for the copper or steel. And this is where we see that interaction come into play. We see a relatively small value for P interaction. And if you see something like that going on, there, there might be something that, that you don't understand experimentally, or there might be some other reason that the large fillet improved the strength of the plastic sample more than the copper or steel.
So to conclude, I'll leave these six simulated data sets here with their associated p-values, just so you can see qualitatively the differences in the data sets and how they affect the p-values.